Alrighty, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, my name is Karen Brady. I'm an educational consultant at Patton Harrisburg, and I am very excited to help facilitate this session for everyone today. Just a few housekeeping items before this session begins. The handouts for the session are at the Patent Literacy Symposium are housed on Schoology. The session handouts are in the folder for today in the time slot for this session and under the name of this session. This session is 75 minutes long and will be recorded. The chat feature will be off between participants, but you will be able to chat with me if you have any needs. If you require closed captioning, please hit the show subtitles under the closed captioning tab at the bottom of your screen. Please keep your video feature off and mute yourself to eliminate any potential distractions to the presenter. The presenter has requ uh, um, requested that any questions be put in the chat periodically at predetermined times and we will stop for questions. We would love for you to tweet and share um, your experiences on so social media at Patent Literacy. The Patent Literacy Symposium hashtag is hashtag, hashtag PA Lit Symposium 2020. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Shana Montgomery. Shana Montgomery is an educational consultant at the Capital Area Intermediate Unit 15 in Enola, Pennsylvania. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Human Development and Family Studies from the Pennsylvania State University and her master's degree in education of the deaf and hard of hearing from Bloomsburg University of PA. As a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing, she worked with students from birth through 21 years of age who had a wide range of hearing loss as well as other disabilities. During that time, she cultivated her passions for language access and development, inclusive environments, and using technology to support students with disabilities. She now works as an educational consultant in the areas of assistive technology and inclusive practices. She is a level two Google certified educator, as well as a Pennsylvania certified trainer of language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling letters. Shanna is an advocate of applying universal design for learning UDL to ensure that all learners can access and participate in rigorous and robust academic instruction and to thrive in their educational environments. So let's welcome Shanna Montgomery. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. This is the first time I've actually heard that read aloud. Usually I'm just reading it and tweaking it and it's a little weird. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us. I just put um, uh, the link to the Google Slides in the chat. So it's a bit.ly link, it's also on my screen. Um, but if you would like to follow along with the slides, you can, you can do that. Um, I have my email and my Twitter handle at the bottom of the screen, so please feel free to contact me. Um, if, you don't, if you have a question that doesn't get answered during our session, please feel free to reach out. Um, follow me on Twitter. I am not, a, I'm not really, really active on Twitter, but I do try to post things periodically um, that I find that I, I think are helpful. So welcome today. We're going to be talking about some Google tools for reading access and a little bit about our um, format today is that um, if you are unfamiliar with Zoom, which I'm kind of making an assumption that a lot of people are more familiar with Zoom now than they were say four months ago, uh, but if you are still new to Zoom or you're not sure about Zoom, um, if you want to explore some online resources during the webinar, uh, you will probably have to click out of the um, full screen view, and then you can navigate around your window. The other thing that I created, and I'm gonna throw the link here into the chat, is I created a Google Doc of interactive notes. And what interactive notes are, it's kind of like a chat hack, um, in that I love to see your interactions with each other. I love to see how you, um, are thinking about the things that you're seeing as I'm as I'm demonstrating them and um, ways that you might want to use them. So this interactive notes is just a Google Doc that you um, it's an open Google Doc. So if you click into it, you can add your thoughts, you can add information, uh, you can add ask questions on there. And I will check it after the webinar and try to respond to things. Um, my goal is to respond to any questions I get on there before the end of the symposium tomorrow. Uh, that's my goal. 
And I will just put a caveat in that um, I can't promise, but that's my goal. Um, so you can do that. The other thing I would ask as far as the interactive notes, I put a sample on the first line. I created a table. You can type things underneath the table. I figured the table might be a little bit easier to keep things organized if there's many people in and um, editing that document at the same time. Um, so if you want to chat to someone else and someone puts something in there that's a great idea and you want to recognize that, um, I showed a sample of how to do that in the notes. So um, you can use that or not use it. It's totally up to you. All right, so a little bit about me other than my, my bio. Um, I am a mom of three kids. There's my three kids right there. Uh, we, that was a, a picture of Hershey Park a couple years ago. And I'm also a dog mom. So that's my, my sweet little sunshine there in the middle. Um, so those are two th or well, really four things that are keeping me busy right now and uh, during the summer. Um, some other things that I really think about when I think about who really am I and, and why do you why should you care about what I talk about? Um, I am a letters trainer, a Pennsylvania certified letters trainer and a level two Google certified educator. So um, I spent a lot of my time um, focusing on assistive technology for academics, particularly reading and writing. So I spent a lot of time learning about that and training on that. Um, and I've learned a lot over the years about things that you can use to make um, academics more accessible, particularly, particularly reading and writing. Some of my um, interests and some of my professional inspirations are here on the screen. So uh, my, that first picture there is me with Anita Archer, who I met or I got to see at the last literacy symposium at Patton. You might recognize that background there at Patton Harrisburg. Um, and that was the first time I got to hear her live and, and she is amazing. I hope that you get a chance to listen to her uh, session yesterday or if she has other ones, um, I know she has the end notes. So um, make sure you, you definitely tune into that. Uh, next to that picture is David Rose. David Rose is the founder, one of the, the founding members of CAST, which is um, kind of the hub of universal design for learning, and which is another passion of mine. Down below, uh, Anita Archer and I is some colleagues of mine and I with Shelley Moore, who is an inclusive practices researcher and amazing storyteller. And then next to that is um, me with Carol Tolman, one of our letters uh, training events. So um, Carol Tolman, as you may know, is one of the authors of Letters, and um, she has been a real in inspiration to learning more about um, how kids learn to read and spell and um, has really defined some of the things that I've done. So just to give you a little bit of background about where I come from and the, the things that inspire me and the things that I'm interested in um, as I go through and, and try to teach you a little bit about the, the things that we're going to talk about today. So I have two goals in our one hour today, about an hour. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I want to introduce online tools to increase text accessibility for struggling learners or struggling readers. So we're really looking at how to make reading more accessible, especially when reading online um, or on a device, which um, if you haven't done, if you hadn't done a lot of device reading before February, uh, you probably were uh, experiencing a trial by fire uh, once the COVID-19 hit and we had a lot of school closures. So I want to show you some things that maybe you've seen before, maybe you haven't. And then my other goal for today is really to demonstrate some practical uses for these tools. So I don't want to just show you tools and tools and tools. I want to show you how to apply them and use them in your own practice. So those are my goals. But what I'd like you to do is I would like you to take a second and um, think about what do you, what goals do you have for the session today? So what's something that you would like to learn? Um, what's something that you are interested in knowing about when you looked at, at the title and saw Google tools for reading access? What's something that um, made you think that would be a good session to join? And then how will successful achievement go of your goals look? So take just a second, I'm gonna stop talking for about 15 or 20 seconds and um, give you a chance to write down some ideas about what your goals are and how it might look if you successfully achieve those goals. Okay, so you may ask why I'm, I'm asking you to set a goal. Um, 
having clear and salient goals is part of the universal design for learning framework. And I try to do a, a, all of my um, presentations, everything that I, I do as far as instruction, I try to use that framework. So it really helps to start thinking about what are your goals and um, how will they, how will you achieve success? So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few different tools and I tried to focus on free tools um, because let's face it, no one has any money. So we're going to focus on some free tools that you can use to make reading more accessible for students. And um, if you are following along in the slides, the next several slides have information about each of these tools. I'm not going to go through those slides specifically because the majority of our time today is really going to be with demonstrations. So I'm going to actually take you into some different areas in the web and show you these tools and explain how you can use them. So the extensions that we're going to look at are Mercury Reader, Claro Read, Google Translate, Google Dictionary, and we're going to look at Read and Write for Google. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about some optical character rec recognition or OCR from Google. Um, and these are all things that Google provides through their Chrome Web Store. So before I go into actually showing these, I want to talk you, I want to talk to you a little bit about how accessibility works in Google Chrome, uh, which is what we're going to be using today. So Google Chrome does not have a lot of built-in accessibility features. And when I say built-in accessibility features, I mean that when you add features on to um, use assistive technology in Google Chrome, you'll do that through adding extensions, which are third party pieces of software. Um, we're going to look at both extensions and web apps today. So an extension is uh, a third party piece of software. A web app is that same type of thing hosted on a website. So you would go to a website in that. And I'll show you this in a second. Um, this will look different if you're running a Chromebook or um, a, say a tablet or um, an, uh, an Apple device. Those devices all have built in accessibility. So what we're talking about right now is if you are running just the Chrome browser. So for example, I run um, a Lenovo laptop and I'm going to open my browser here in just a second. And so everything I'm showing you can be done right in Chrome. So I'm going to show you starting out with Mercury Reader how to add an extension really quickly in case you don't know how to do that. And um, each of these links here will get you to the extensions. So if you see something that you like, you can always come back to this page. Just click on the link and it will take you right into a spot to add that extension to your browser. So I'm going to go to Mercury Reader. This is the website for Mercury Reader and there's lots of information here. You can scroll down and it will give you some information about how to use it, what it does. Um, but what I want to focus on right now is this button right here where it says install Mercury Reader for Chrome. And when I click on that, it's going to redirect me to the Chrome Web Store. And if you've never been to the Chrome Web Store, all you have to do is type in your search bar up here, your Omni bar, Chrome Web Store, and it will take you there. Um, now you'll see on my screen over here, I have this button that says remove from Chrome. That's because I already have it added. When you add an extension, when you get into the, the extension area on the Chrome Web Store, this will say add to Chrome. When you click that, it will ask you for some permissions. Uh, just to make sure that it can access the, the website and then you can start using it. Once you add that, you'll see up here, actually here is the icon for Mercury Reader. And then up here, you'll see my extension um, tray. So it's right up here. These are all, these, link, these little icons are all different extensions and you can see my Mercury Reader right here. And it looks gray instead of orange because right now I have it turned off. So I'm going to show you how to use this. And to do that, I'm going to open an article that I found. So Mercury Reader, what it does is it simplifies web pages. It kind of streamlines them to make it a little easier to read. So if you'll see my article here, and, and let's say, for example, that um, I am going to assign this article to students to read as part of their, their um, instruction for whatever course, whatever content area. And I give them this article and when I scroll down, I have my article, but you'll see I have lots of stuff here. I have a pop-up video that actually I'm going to close. I have lots of 
adds some things maybe inappropriate for students. Um, really, it's a very, very busy web page. So there's lots of things up here. I can buy some rings online. Um, so as students are looking at this, I really want to give them a tool to make it much easier to read. And that tool that I'm gonna show you is Mercury Reader. So I'm going to go up here to my Mercury Reader icon and I'm going to click this. And you'll see when I click this, it will turn orange. And when Mercury Reader is enabled, when it's orange, it's going to change the look of my website. So let me click this. There it goes to turn orange. And now what Mercury Reader does is it filters all of the ads, all of the extra stuff on the page, and it just gives me a nice clean version of my article. So now I can go down here and I still have some pictures. Sometimes Mercury Reader will filter out pictures and um, I haven't figured out what the rhyme or reason to that is. So this one, I, it, it preserved the pictures, some it does not. Um, and so now I can read this article um, in a nice clean way. Now what you, I want you to notice though, is that, let me turn this off here a second. When I turn it off, it takes me right back to the original web page. And in fact, if you watch, I'm going to turn it on again. And if you watch my, my um, web address bar, my Omni bar up here, when I click on Mercury Reader, even though my page changes, the web address bar does not. So I'm still on the same web address. I'm still on that same web page. It's just applying some filtering features. Once I'm in Mercury Reader, I can use the settings tab up here. So this little gray gear icon at the top right of the page. When I click that, it's going to give me some, some settings that now I can even customize the look of this even more. So as far as text size, I can make the text smaller. I can make it medium or large. I can add or remove the serif. So the serif is um, the feature of the text that um, creates that that weightedness to the bottom of letters. So let me just scroll down here. Oops, no, I can do it right here. So when I turn off the serif, when I hit sans, that's turning off the serif. You can see how the letters change. So now they don't have that little um, 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 feature at the bottom where they have kind of a, a little bit of anchoring on the letters. So you can change that on and off and that's a, a preference. And then I can also change the theme to light or dark. So this might be helpful for um, students who maybe have a, a certain visual uh, impairment or a, a visual need where they would need that, that dark contrast or if I'm reading at night um, and I don't wanna have that bright light in my, in my eyes. So those are the, the different types of customization I can do with Mercury Reader. The other thing I can do, so let's say I wanna save this for later and I wanna read it or I wanna read it across devices um, and I don't wanna to have to find it every time. I can save this clean copy of the article by using my print feature. So you can hit Control P for print if you're on um, a device, uh, the, um, a PC or laptop, or I can also right click. So I'm gonna right click here on my document. I can hit print. And I don't wanna print this, I wanna save it. So once I have my print option up here, what I can do is for my destination, I can hit save as PDF, save to Google Drive, and then I can save it where I wanna save it. So that way I have this clean, feed, this clean version of the um, article and I can access it then from somewhere else. Let me cancel out of that. When I'm done, all I do is turn Mercury Reader off and it takes me back to my original um, website. So that's Mercury Reader. It's pretty quick, it's pretty easy, and um, it's a really nice tool. And even though I put this as a reading access tool, it's much more of an executive function tool. So, so um, it helps to kind of filter things out so that there's less distraction, less things happening, um, and that I can focus more on the text. The next tool I wanna to show you is Claro Read. And Claro Read is a text-to-speech tool, <clears throat> excuse me, that's free. Um, and the image, the, the icon for Claro Read is this little speech bubble right here with a star on it. And Claro Read, let me move some things around my screen here. When I click this, 
it will turn on my Claro Read, which is just this little menu right here. And you'll see it's a pretty simplified menu. Um, when I use Claro Read, I have a play, a pause, or a play, a stop, and I have some settings. So I'm gonna demonstrate Claro Read. What you, what you do with Claro Read is you can select your text. So now I am um, have my same article here. But amid the coronavirus outbreak, reading lips has become more difficult with state and federal officials recommending and some requiring people to wear masks in public. So did, were you able to hear my, my audio? Okay. So Claro Read is just a speech to text or a text to speech um, extension that is free and um, it allows you to read out loud and it also has some additional features for writing. Um, it does have some word predictions. So if you um, were in a website where you wanted students to read this and then maybe post a comment, if you use, if you are a, a news ELA or um, a, there's another one that is skipping my memory right now, but if you um, are assigning students articles and then they are able to comment on them, they can actually turn on some prediction for this too. So I'm gonna show you a little bit about the settings in Claro Read. Um, right now I have mine set up so that whenever I select the text, it will automatically play. So I don't have to, I don't have to click anything. I can just go ahead in and um, um, use my Claro Read and it will automatically start reading to me. I also can uh, manage the highlight color. So I can use whatever color to my preference that it will highlight the text as it reads. I can set it, whoops, I can change my settings to do some different things. So I might be able to just have it to speak um, under the mouse. So if I hover over an area, it will speak automatically. The echo section down here on my um, settings is where I can set up to, um, playback things that I type. So as I'm typing in, I might want it to say the characters. So as I type my name, it would say S-H-A-N-A -A as I type that. Um, you can have it say the whole word or you can have it say the whole sentence. I'm not going to enable those right now because they do get um, a little distracting if when I have that on, um, especially because I often forget to turn it off. I can use prediction. So this is again, um, if you are having students read and then respond, they can have some word prediction. It's fairly good word prediction. Um, what I found is in the area of word prediction, you get what you pay for. And since Claro Read is a free extension, it's not the best word prediction, but if you have some, a student that needs that, um, it's, it's an option that you can use. So, um, Claire Read, I really like this one because it's, it's a quick and easy tool to use. It also has the start and stop feature. So some speech to text speech, uh, text to speech features, keep um, saying that backwards today, some text to speech features will allow you to highlight um, text and then play it but it doesn't give you the option to stop it so you have to wait until it gets done. So right now with Claro Read, if I highlight this whole section here and I start. Mary Beth Pagnella, who has lived with profound hearing loss most of her life. And now I need to stop because I need to go do something else or, um, you know, for whatever reason I need to stop it. I just hit the stop button and it stops and then I can re-highlight and pick up where I left off. Um, so that is Claro Read. Let me just make sure that I didn't miss anything. All right. So I'm gonna stop for just a second and ask Karen if there are any questions that have come up about either Mercury Reader, Claro Read, or getting um, into extensions or the using the, um, the accessibility features through the extensions. I don't have any questions right now. If anybody wants to put them in the chat, we can certainly address those. Okay. So if you do have questions that you want addressed now during the um, webinar, put them in the chat. Otherwise, if you're using the interactive notes, I will get to them in a little bit. Thank you. So as far as Claro Read, when I'm done with it, all I do is I click the X here and it goes away. Um, with extensions, you might want to um, look into which extensions are automatically enabled and which ones you have to turn on and off. So for example, Mercury Reader and Claro Read are two that are um, 
I have to turn on and off. So when I want to use Claro Read, I click the extension icon, it turns on. I can use it when I'm done. I can either um, X out or click the icon again, and then it's turned off. So it won't show up on everything. Same thing with Mercury Reader. Um, some other extensions that I'm gonna show you are extensions that are automatically enabled. And um, at, when you have them running, they will do their job without you um, having to necessarily turn them on. So an extension that I wanna show you is Google Translate, which is this little icon up here, this blue with the, the blue icon with the G. And Google Translate is a great way to support students who are English learners and who may be um, having some trouble with um, maybe getting all of the concepts that you're wanting them to get when they're reading um, a document online or something that, that you have assigned to them when they don't have quite the full understanding of the vocabulary in English. So with Google Translate, what I do is I'm still on my article here. And the one other thing I will say about these is sometimes you can layer extensions. So sometimes I can use multiple extensions at the same time. Um, which is the, ex the case with Google Translate and Google, Google Dictionary, another one that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, and sometimes you can't. So, for example, I can't turn on my Mercury Reader and use Claro Read on top of that. So that is, is definitely a drawback, and I have to think about how I'm going to um, access the tools that I need if I can't necessarily overlay those extensions. So back to Google Translate. So if I have a student who is reading this article and they get to a word that maybe they're not quite sure of. So let's look here at recommending. This is a multisyllabic word. It might be something that they're not quite sure how to attack, especially if they're an English learner. They can highlight the word and you'll notice here right below my word, I have my Google Translate icon. So when I highlight a word, it, that icon is gonna pop up when I have my, um, um, extension enabled. When I click on that, it's going to give me the word and then it's going to give me the translated word. And in my settings, I have it set up to translate into German. And the nice thing about this is I can choose the um, original language. So the original language is English. It's going to give me the word and then the, the German translation right next to it. And it also has a read aloud feature. So if I'm reading this and um, for students who, and this was perfect that we just saw Louisa Motes talk about how speech is the anchor for print um, because you may have students who are English learners who may not have great print skills in their, their first spoken language. So for example, if I have a student who is reading German or, or who is a, a, a native German speaker, but maybe has not learned a lot of uh, reading skills in German, they can actually listen to both of these, these words. So maybe they just need to hear how to pronounce the English word. Recommending. Um, maybe they, they know German, but they haven't learned to read this word yet, so then they can actually hear it pronounced in German. Empfehlen. So they can use those, um, those read aloud features to actually hear the word so that they can see not only the print, but then also hear the word in speech. Down here, when you have the, um, the, the item enabled, you have the extension options. And anytime you go into your extension options, this is where you can really customize things. So I said, my primary, lang my primary language is German. That's what, that's what it's going to translate into. And it also gives me some, I some options for what happens. So when I select a word or phrase, do I want the display icon to click or to show up so that I can click it? So when I, I selected that word, that little Google Translate icon showed up, that's how I have my settings, or I can set it to immediately display that pop-up. So as soon as I select that word or phrase, it will immediately translate and put that pop-up. Um, and then I can also kind of, kind of disable it so that it doesn't display either, and I would have to go in and, and actually click on the, the icon. You'll notice that there are a lot of different languages here. So these are all the languages that Google supports because this is a, an extension that's created by Google. Um, one thing I will say is that there are some Google languages that do not support the, the read aloud or the, um, 
yeah, the read aloud feature. So there might be, I think I found one last night. So if I say that my primary language is Hmong um, and I save that and then I, ch I click into, sorry, I have too, too many things on my screen here. I can't see everything. And then I try to translate this word. See, there's my pop-up. Now it has my Hmong translation, translation, but it does not support the, the read aloud feature. So I can hear it in English. Recommending. But I don't have that option in the Hmong. So that's just one thing to think about. If you do have students who um, are translating into a language that the, does not have the, the speak aloud feature, that's just something to be aware of. So as far as Google Translate and all of these tools, one thing that I really want to make sure that I talk about and I stress is the fact that um, even though sometimes I feel like my students can be much more tech savvy than I am, um, I still need to really make sure that I'm explicitly teaching how to use these tools. So for example, I can't just tell a student, hey, you know what, here is a great, a great uh, tool a great extension, why don't you add it and try it? Um, I really want to make sure that I'm working with students to go through and have them practice. So I can go through and I can say, all right, let's pick a word and we'll translate it together. And I'll show them how to do that. And I wanna show them how to um, configure their settings so that they know what to, what to do and how to, how to change that and customize it so that it works for them. Another way to configure settings for my, um, extensions in general is when I hover over my actual extension icon in my extension tray and I right click, it will give me some options. So if um, I find that I have extensions that I no longer use, I can remove it, I can hide it, or I can go into my options feature and that will take me right back into the options. So for some extensions, you will have the option once you're in and using the extension to access the, the settings menu, just like when I had the word highlighted and it gave me that option at the bottom to access the settings. Some other extensions, you can't get into the, the settings right from whatever you're doing on the screen. So you do need to use the, the right click feature. All right, I see some things popping up in the chat here. So I'm gonna stop a second and see if there are any questions. We have one question. Um, yes. Can I open any PDF or doc and use these extensions? Great question. So the answer to that is not necessarily, kind of like a maybe. So one thing that um, I do want to show you, and um, maybe I'll do this now, is there's a different, not all PDFs are created equally. So there's two types of, P actually there's three types of PDF, but for today we're going to talk about two. There's an accessible PDF and an inaccessible PDF. So an accessible PDF is um, a type of document that has been created so that these types of accessibility features can be used on it. And I'm going to open one up quick. I have some examples here. Let me open this. So I have here a, a PDF and the quick and quick and easy way to, to tell if a, a PDF is accessible or not is to try to select text on it. So an accessible PDF will allow you to select text. An inaccessible PDF will not allow you to select text. So this PDF here is an accessible PDF. So as I try to select some text, you see how I'm able to click and drag and select information on my screen. That tells me that this PDF is accessible. An accessible PDF will allow me to use my, um, my extensions to access this. So let me click up here on Claro Read. And let me select here. And it's not gonna work, of course. So, this is where that whole idea of being able to layer certain types of extensions sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. I do have one that I can show you how to use in just a minute. Um, so 
using opening a PDF and just using these tools is kind of like a maybe because first of all, your PDF must be accessible. And second of all, you have to make sure that whatever tool you're using can access different types of information, whether it's a website or the PDF or um, whichever format that you're looking at. So um, that's an example of an accessible PDF. I'm going to skip around here because that's a great question and I want to make sure that I cover it completely. The other example of a PDF is an inaccessible PDF. So this is just a copy of my bio that I had printed out and scanned with my phone. Um, there are tons of phone scanners and there are great ways to make things um, available virtually or digitally, but the problem with scanning things in, whether it's on a phone or even running it through a copying machine um, and scanning it that way, is that unless you have very specific settings on a copier, and I don't know that there's many that a phone will do for free, um, but if you run your worksheet or your article or whatever you're having students read through the copier, what it essentially does is when you upload that, your computer views that as a picture. So right now, my computer is, um, if I tried to use a tool on here, it would tell me there's no, there's no text to, to view because this is a scanned PDF. It just sees it as a picture. Um, so what you can do, an, an option that you can use with this is to actually use some Google tools to convert this. And this is where the optical character recognition or OCR comes in. And what OCR does is it runs um, some software on the actual um, text and it will optic optically recognize the characters. So it will say this looks like an S and so it will convert it to an accessible version and it will, it will just recognize the, the characters and do that. And a few years ago, Google um, made this a free, a free service. Um, I'd say up to three years ago, in order to get good optical character recognition where you could convert things that were inaccessible, you had to pay. It was a paid service for a lot of places. Um, but now what you can do is if you have your document, you'll see at the top of my screen this little box that says open with. So when I click on that, I'm going to choose Google Docs. And what that's going to do, it's going to take a second and think. And right now, Google is going through and doing that optical character recognition or OCR. And what it's done is it, it's taken my inaccessible PDF where I could not select text and it's changed it into a Google Doc, which is now accessible. So you'll see that here I have my original and now here is my converted accessible Google Doc. And now I can start using some tools on this. So when I select this and turn on my Clearo Read, oops. Shana Montgomery is an educational consultant. So now you'll see that I am able to use that tool to read my text. Um, and this is something that I think more people are learning about as far as OCR. And it's a great tool. It's, it's a wonderful option for students who need that speech to te or text to speech um, tool or, or support. One thing I always ask teachers to do though is when they're using these tools is this is a great time to have conversations about things like plagiarism. Because now I have, I've taken um, my inaccessible article. So let's just imagine that this was an article that I wanted students to read as part of a research project. Well, now I have an accessible version of this. So I can cut and paste, I can highlight things, which is great for if I'm reading this to take notes, I can copy and paste this into a notes document. Um, but it's really easy at this point now because this is someone else's work and I have an accessible version of it to take whole chunks and forget about the fact that um, this is someone else's work and I need to cite it. So when you're using these tools, I definitely would work into your um, your instruction on not only how to use these tools, but then um, some appropriate um, ways to use these tools as they're then creating their own information. So I talk to students about plagiarism and saying, you know, when you have access to this, it's great because now we can use our accessibility tools to read. However, we can't just start taking things out of it and using it in our own work without either properly citing it or um, summarizing, paraphrasing things so that we're not 
plagiarizing information. So that's a little bit about accessible versus inaccessible PDFs and how to tell the difference and how to use even an inaccessible PDF to make it um, available to the, the tools that we're using. Okay. So the next tool I wanna to show you is Google Dictionary. And for that one, I'm gonna go back to my article. And Google Dictionary will let me, um, will, will provide not only the definition for the word, but that also has the read aloud option. So let me find a new word here. Uh, how about restrictions? Nope, let's try, try this one. And the reason I'm not choosing restrictions is you'll notice, see how this section of text is underlined? It's because that is a link. So when I try to highlight, if I click here, it's going to um, put me into that link. So I'm not gonna be able to highlight that word restrictions. Um, if I um, apply some other tools. I might be able to, but for today, I'm not going to, to worry about that just, just yet. So I'm just going to, um, for the purpose of time and showing this other tool, I'm going to click a different word. So let's try expression. So with expression, I don't necessarily need it to translate, but I do want to know what the definition of that word is because maybe it's a word I haven't seen before. So I'm going to use my Google dictionary tool up here, which is this red book with the A on it. And when I click that, it's pulled my word that I've highlighted into it and it's given me the definition. So again, I can use the read aloud feature to listen to it. Expression. So I can hear the pronunciation of the word. It divides it, it syllabicates it. Um, and then it gives me some definitions. Um, it also gives me some synonyms. So this is a nice tool as I'm reading and maybe I, I encounter words that um, are unfamiliar it can give me a little bit more information about that. Um, let me make sure I'm telling all of the things that I wanted to tell you about this. Google Translate and Google Dictionary are not going to work on PDFs from Drive. So what I can do though is um, I can put these into the web app. So what I've shown you so far is the Google Dictionary and Google Translate extension, which are my little icons up here. Both Google Dictionary and Google Translate also have web applications, which is basically the same function, but I can now um, translate and define longer sections, or I can translate longer chunks of text. Um, I can define, define words differently or, or search for different um, definitions if the ones that I'm finding are not meeting my needs. So I'm going to jump back into Google Translate here and show you this. So I can translate this page. So some more features of Google Translate, which I apologize, I just jumped around, but I realized I didn't, I didn't share this information with you. So when I hit translate this page, what it will do is it will take the entire web page and it will translate it into my chosen language. So I'm gonna go back to German. And so now it's, it's translated the entire page. So whereas before I was just translating a single word, so if I have a student who maybe has some English skills and is able to read a lot of the text, but maybe just needs some support with individual words or phrases, they can use that piece of the extension. Or if I have someone who is maybe newer to the English language and is able to read in another language, then they can read in um, their their first language or their, their language of origin. And then as I hover over here, it will show me the original text. So I can use that as a um, comparison between the original and the translated text. So Shauna, we, um, we have a participant who's not able to find Google Dictionary as an extension. Is there only certain particular programs that you would find this extension? Um, I am not sure if you go to uh, dictionary.google.com, I believe is the website. As a matter of fact, let me just look here quick. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, 
what I can do is I can look for that then and I can post it in the interactive notes. What you can do is in the slides, the slide deck for today, if you click on Google Dictionary, it should take you right to the Chrome Web Store where you could add the Google Dictionary extension. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So with Google Translate, like I showed you, I can translate the entire page right where I'm, where it's located. So I didn't leave this web page. I just translated it here. The other thing I can do is I can actually open the Google Translate web app. So let me click on here. And when I click on more, it puts me into the web app. So this is just the Google Translate website. And if you'll notice at the top, it says translate.google.com. So that's kind of Google's coding um, pattern for finding their tools. So if you go to maps.google.com, it will take you to Google Maps. If you go to docs. or drive.google.com, that's, that's the, the format that they use. So translate.google.com will take you into Google Translate. And here what I can do is now I can listen to this word being read aloud. Language. I can use it, I can choose different um, um, languages and I can also hear it. Sprache. I can use a uh, voice input feature. So now if I'm speaking in English and I want to have it translated real time, I can turn this on. Today is June 11th. And what it will do is as I'm let me turn that off. As I'm speaking in English over here, it will be translating it real time in German on this side. So you can use that feature. You can also um, cut and paste. So if I have a, a large piece of text that I want to translate, I'm going to go back in here into my accessible PDF. And I can cut and paste an entire section of text. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go back into Google Translate. And now what I'm going to do, is I'm going to paste this in here. And then it will translate. So if um, I run into a situation where it cannot translate something on the web page and I still want it translated, I can use this as a backup to translate chunks of text or articles or things like that, longer pieces up to 5,000 characters. I can also type in here. So if I just want to type a word, I can just type it and it will also translate. So that's a great tool for students who um, need that support of either having individual words or whole um, sections of text translated so that it's, it's accessible to them. All right, so let me go back and make sure I got everything from Google Translate so I don't have to jump around so much anymore. Another really um, functional way to use this is as either your students are interacting with text or you are providing some supports for them to interact with text is that I can now start to think about what are ways that I can anticipate barriers for my students and start to design my materials and my instruction around those. So one thing I'm going to show you, and this isn't necessarily um, a specific tool, but I can now start to think ahead about the things that I'm assigning. So if I know I have a student who um, definitely is going to need some, some vocabulary support for either a definition or a different uh, language. What I can do, and I can do this in my Google Docs, I can do it in my PDF, I'm just going to use my Google, Google Docs here, is that I can now start to um, incorporate some of these tools into other tools in Google. So I'm going to use this word environments. And what I'm going to do is I know that as a student who's reading down, a student is reading down through here, they might have trouble with that word. And I want to provide some supports so that it's easier for the student and it's, it's quickly accessible and they don't have to go find it themselves. I would definitely recommend teaching students how to go find this themselves and how to utilize these tools like translate and dictionary so that they are more independent when they come on words that maybe I have not thought about would be barriers for them. 
but these are ways that we as teachers can provide some of these supports. So I'm going to look at the word environments. I'm going to go to my translate. And I know that I have a student who does speak German, that environments is going to be a problem. So I'm going to take my translated word, I'm going to copy it. So I just hit the right, I right clicked and use my copy feature. Then I'm going to go back into my document here. I have my word highlighted and I'm going to click this little comment button. And what this will do is it's going to highlight my word. And now I can right click, hit paste. And now I have that German translation of that word in there. So as I, I send this to a student, as they're reading and they get to this word environments, they see that it's highlighted and they can go and they can find the comment with that translation. I can do the same thing with my definition. So I'm going to pick another word here. I'm going to use my dictionary feature. And you'll notice I don't have the, they didn't pull the word in. And if that happens, because again, on different types of web pages, whether you're in a Google Doc, it will work different, a little bit differently. But now all I have to do is type in the word, hit define. I can find the definition that works for me. Um, so I'm going to say a state or outburst of strong emotion, um, an intense sexual love or an intense desire or enthusiasm for something. Well, in my uh, bio, it really is this third one. So I'm gonna highlight this, I'm going to copy it. And again, I'm going to add a comment so that right away I have my definition. So my comments will show up along the side here. And then as I'm reading and I click on this word, it will highlight this comment. So I know that this is the definition for that, com that word. I can even add the word here so that it makes that, that very clear connection for students. So these are ways that as a teacher, I would use these tools to support my students. And I would also uh, make sure that I'm teaching them as I'm doing it. I might, I might pull up a document and show them um, during my instruction how I'm doing it and help them learn how to do it for themselves so that as they are reading um, independently, they know how to access these tools. All right, so I have one more tool that I wanna show and then we should have plenty of time for um, some discussion or some questions. The last tool I wanna show is actually not a free tool. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because um, it's a tool that I really like. And if you do have the ability to, to pay for a subscription, I think it's worth it. But even if you don't have the ability to pay for a subscription for your students, there's still some free features that you can use. And this tool is called Read and Write. Read and Write is um, part of a suite of tools that is um, from TextHelp. So TextHelp is a third party company and they uh, partnered with Google to make Read and Write really integrate very nicely with the, the G Suite apps. So Google Docs, Google, Google Sheets, things like that. And so when I click on my Read and Write icon, which is up here, I get this toolbar. Now this is the full toolbar. I have all of the features and as a teacher, you get access to their full menu of features for free. And on my um, slide deck slides on the read and write slide, there's a link that you can click into that will take you to a place where you can sign up and get the full feature for free. Students, however, cannot get the full features without um, paying for a subscription, which I think is around $150 a year. Now they do get, I believe, a 30 day free trial and so what I encourage um, teachers to do is to have their students sign up for the free trial. They can use all the features for 30 days, but after those 30 days are over, Read and Write does allow free access to two of the features. So the first feature um, or feature group is the text to speech. So the reading features, this play, pause and stop. So after 30 days, um, if you have a student that does the trial and their 30 days expires and they don't pay for the, the subscription, these other icons will be all grayed out. Um, but the play, pause, and stop will remain and also Read and Write's translate feature. So they have their own translator feature. 
and those two features will remain free. So even if you're not interested and you think we, no one has the money or we're not interested in even thinking about paying for something, it's still worth the download because you'll, you'll keep those features for free. And because Read and Write is um, a company that is primarily focused on assistive technology, their features are very high quality. So that's why I, I kind of put this out there as something to try. So Read and Write is the same idea as Clara Read. And what I can do is I can select my text. Oops. And then I can hit the play button. She received her B. Period. S. In human development and family studies from the Pennsylvania. One thing I like a little bit more about Read and Write versus Claro is they have a pause feature. So if you remember when we were in Claro, um, well, it was reading. And if I had to stop for some reason, I hit the stop button, it stopped. And then when I wanted to go back, I had to actually re-highlight where I was in my reading and start again. With Read and Write, it has a pause feature. So if you'll notice, I hit the pause button instead of the stop button and my text is still highlighted. And now when I hit pause again, it will pick up right where it left off. In your state university and her M. If I hit the stop button, it will stop, it will clear my selection, and then I have to reselect. So that's one kind of advantage over having a pause button versus just a play and stop button. Um, the translator feature will do single words. So again, if I want to translate information and I'm gonna choose a word and in Read and write, I just, this is the translator feature and I can hit translator and it gives me not only the word, um, it gives me some other uh, derivatives of that word and I think I have it set to Italian. Um, and it does have the speak aloud feature also. Handicap. Menomazione. Infermità. So those are different um, words that mean the same as disabilities in Italian, and then you can listen to not only those translations, but also the original English. Disabilities. Um, the other thing that I really like about Read and Write is they have very high quality voices. So when I go into my settings, which is this little menu icon, I want to go to my options, and under my speech, options, I can choose which voice I want. So I can choose if I'm using, um, so say I am translating into Italian, I can, um, or I'm reading it in Italian, I can choose an Italian voice, or I can choose an English voice. I can choose a female or a male. So I have um, US English is Ava, Samantha, Allison, and then I have a US English male voice. I'll just show you what that sounds like. Sorry, I have too many Zoom controls here that are covering things up. And. Access. So you hear I can. During that time, she cultivated the RP. I can have um, male or female voices if you have students that prefer that. And some students, um, it might sound kind of crazy, but for some students, being able to have those options to customize things is, is the make or, make or break deal or the make or break feature of whether they use these tools or not. So that's a little bit about Read and Write. So I know I showed you a lot of tools. I know that if you're not familiar with tools, this can be a little overwhelming. Um, and I want to take a minute before we wrap up here um, to have you think about your goal and whether you met your goal and go back to my slides. So like I said, I have in the slide deck, I have slides for each of these things. So for Mercury Reader, if you're interested in that, you can click right on this link and it will take you into the Chrome Web Store so you can add that. There's links on each of these that will take you there so that you can automatically add them. You don't have to go searching for them. And I tried to put some pictures of what um, either the, the um, extension looks like, the features look like, or the um, settings pages look like. There's for Google Dictionary, you can click on there and add it to Chrome. Um, there's translation and extension, so you can get into the web apps on both of those. And uh, read and write, oh, right here, where it says get a free account here, if you click on the word here, that will take you into the sign up for the free account for teachers. So I tried to make it as easy as possible so you didn't have to search for things. Um, you can find them right there. 
So some final thoughts before I have you think about and reflect on your goal. Number one, these tools are not meant to be an either or. So we're at a literacy conference and um, as a letters trainer, I have a passion for teaching students to develop their reading skills. And as an assistive technology consultant, I have a passion for giving students options and tools to be able to access reading and access text. And I don't think that either of those things are a one or the other type situation. So I always, always, always would advocate for students to develop their reading skills no matter where or what age they are. Um, we know through research that um, even as adults, they can improve, people can improve their, their reading skills. So I would always say, we, will, we wanna make sure that our bar is set high for students to learn to read and to learn those skills. However, in the meantime, as students are um, participating in their classes and their course content, if reading is a barrier for them um, to be able to participate fully and meaningfully in their content, then that's where we can use these tools to supplement um, their instruction so that they're able to continue to participate with their, their peers. Um, and I would never say, well, they have a, a speech to text or text to speech um, tool, so don't worry about teaching them how to read. That is never something I would recommend. I would always say, let's, let's figure out a way to make both of these things work together so that the student can participate fully in their instruction. Um, another thought that I had is to make sure that we plan for instruction of both the function and the purpose. So no matter what, we always wanna make sure we're, we're providing instruction on these tools and how to use them. So not only the features of the tools, make, making sure that we're um, configuring our settings to work for the student, but also really showing them the, the purpose and the um, really practical ways to use them. So, you know, I can translate words into different languages, but then what do I really do with that? Maybe I, I'm gonna use some um, comments on my, my Google Docs to support that as I'm reading. So I'm not constantly jumping back and forth. Um, maybe I am going to use Mercury Reader to get a clean copy of an article because that all those, those um, ads and things like that is just too visually stimulating for me. And um, I really know that as an executive function support for myself, I, I need that, that tool. So really looking at not only how to use the tool, but what's the purpose? When do I use it? Why would I use it? Um, what are some practical ways that it will really make things better for me? Make the most of teachable moments. And I really think about a lot of different things. So as I, as I talked about how Mercury Reader was more of an executive function skill than typically a reading skill, you know, we wanna talk to students about those types of things. Let's talk about executive function. Let's talk about when things are um, too visually cluttered. Let's talk about when things are distracting. What, what does that do? How do we overcome that? Um, that is a barrier. That can be a barrier for students. It can be a barrier for me um, to have all those things going on. So really talking about what are the, what are the things that are barriers for you and how can we um, work on that? And sometimes it might be the actual text and sometimes it might be more along executive function or other skills. Um, think about how we can use this in note taking. So like I said, once we convert things into accessible forms, then we can highlight and we can cut and we can copy and we can paste and we can pull things um, that can really make note taking a lot easier than having to constantly handwrite things. I remember when I was in, I think, seventh grade and we did our first big research paper and you had that stack of 5,000 note cards, it seemed, and each note card had a quote on one side and the citation on the other side. And um, for some students that might work. I still take a lot of handwritten notes, but for some students that might be really a barrier. So how can we use these accessibility tools to make note taking easier? I did talk about um, plagiarism, how, you know, make sure that we're using these teachable moments to talk about those really significant um, issues and concepts as far as how students are then using these tools to create their own um, items, their own work. And lastly, reflection. Reflection, reflection, reflection is so important. Having students think about, you know, did that really work for me? Was that a tool that I think helped me in some way? And if it did, how did it help me? Um, is there something that it really didn't do for me? So maybe the, um, the reading features in 
read and write didn't work for me as well as they did in Claro Read. So really thinking about and, and giving students time and maybe even some structure to what worked, what didn't, what could be better, what was still a barrier, and how can we think about ways to design or um, eliminate that barrier in the future, which is really all part of universal design for learning. Um, we know that UDL is, um, talks about how some of these tools are gonna be essential for some students. If you have students who really do struggle in reading and they're trying to keep up with a, an academic um, rigorous course that is, has a reading level that's higher than what they're able to access in the moment, um, these tools will be essential for them. But these tools are beneficial to everyone. I use these tools um, as someone who is um, very independent, that I, do, I don't have a reading, uh, a specific reading disability or reading challenges, but I still use these tools because they make things easier for me. So um, think about all of your students. That's one thing I would definitely recommend. Um, definitely for the students who need these supports just to be able to participate meaningfully, but there might be other students that can benefit from these supports also. So those are my final thoughts and let me check my time here. Um, we have some questions. Okay, go ahead and let's, let's address some questions. Or would you like to have us reflect first? How would you like to handle that? Let's, you know what, let's reflect first because there may be questions that come from your reflection. So what I want you to do is I'd like you to think about your goal. Maybe you wrote that goal down. Maybe you just had it in your head from the very beginning of our session. Was your goal accomplished and how do you know? So at the beginning, you wrote your goal, you thought about or you thought about your goal and what would be the criteria for success? Did you accomplish your goal? And what does it look like? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop talking again for about 20 seconds and let you think about this. And then if you have questions that come up from that, we can certainly address them. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to reflect on that really quickly. I know that was not a lot of time to reflect um, in our uh, webinar format. We don't, we are, we are limited by our time. So um, hopefully if, if that wasn't enough time for you, you'll get a chance to um, reflect on that again a little bit later. So Karen, tell me our questions. Let's talk about questions. Yeah, for Google Read and Write, do the teachers get less features after 30 days or only the student-free student, student free accounts? Mm -hmm. So there's two answers to this. Number one, you in order to get the full features and keep them after 30 days, so for a teacher, you have to sign up on that link. You have to provide some information about your school and who your administrator is. Um, you have to provide your, your Google account. And then you will get those full, all of the features for free indefinitely. If you just go and sign up for the free trial and you don't go through that teacher link, then you will lose those features after 30 days unless you then go in and sign up for the, the teacher's version. Um, students will only get the, the full version for 30 days and then after that, their features will go back to those two free, those two free features. So they will keep the reading and writing or the uh, text-to-speech feature and they will keep the translation feature and that is it, the other ones will go away unless they pay for it. Um, one other thing about Read and Write is it's tied to your Google account. So you must have a Google account in order to apply that to your, to your Google Chrome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And other question is where's the optical character reader again? So the optical character rec recognition is just a tool built into Google Docs. So let me go back here. When I open an, oh, a PDF, so at, I have a PDF saved in my drive. So I uploaded this to my Google Drive. When I open it, it looks like this. And then when I want to run the OCR so that it converts it, I have to select open with and then I just want to select Google Docs. So that will convert it to a Google Doc, which will run the OCR on it. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any more questions here today. Um, if you do have any more questions, please feel free to add those to Shana's form that she provided you in the beginning. 
Um, and I would just like to close today. So, so um, Sheena, thank you so much. Um, and for everybody here who attended this session, um, this was recorded and will be available on the Patent YouTube channel in the future. The Patent Literacy Team will also be creating supports aligned to the presentations at the symposium to maximize the learning for families and educators.